perhaps hold the baby, please? Hey, welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in The Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 6, Guns for Hire. Now, I know this is probably going to be one of the most controversial episodes of The Mandalorian. It seems like a pointless side quest, it's got some distracting cameos, and some very distracting cameos. I'm sure all of you have thoughts, and we'd love to hear them down in the comments below. But for me, I thought it was a lot of fun, and did a solid job of moving forward the season's stories. But now, let's get into those Easter eggs. The episode was directed by Bryce Dallas Howard, and it's kind of of a sequel to her last episode, which introduced Bo-Katan and her Mandalorians back in Season 2. That episode also featured Quarren and Mon Calamari, who we begin this episode with. Alright, so like I was saying, this This store is awful! You don't have anything that I need! Hey, can I help you find something? Whatever, I'll find it myself! All right, suit yourself, man. Back to what I was saying. We open on a ship belonging to the Quarren. So the Quarren are an aquatic species who share the planet Mon Cala with the Mon Calamari. You know, like this guy. It's a trap! The Quarren are always, always, always the bad guys, and the Mon Calamari are always shown as the good guys. The Mon Calamari supported the Republic in the Clone Wars, and then the Rebellion in the Galactic Civil War, and the Quarren kind of took the other sides in both those conflicts. And so these two species have always been at odds against each other. There's even a great Clone Wars arc about the Prince of Mon Cala, Lee Char, becoming king of his people and leading them through the Clone Wars. It's all really great stuff. Lee Char was also in power until well into the Rebellion, and in the Star Wars Allegiance comics, we see that the Mon Cala monarchy is still alive and well decades into the future. Now, I'm ranking all of this up because there is a Mon Cala prince in this episode, and I'm wondering if he might be the future king, at Char, who Leia met just prior to the events of Rise of Skywalker. Anyways, I love the design of the Quarren ship. It is shaped like the head of a Quarren, but it also has these bulges on the outside. These are like the designs of the Mon Cala Calamari capital ships that we saw in Return of the Jedi. So the planet's two species do share some of these unique design techniques. And the interior is also very cool. I love how since this is an aquatic species, the captain's chair has the option to be underwater. And then they bring her this like fish martini and like a really nice glass just so they can dump the fish into the tank. It's the kind of like small world building detail that makes Star Wars feel like rich and lived in without having to explain like every nuance and corner of the galaxy. So the ship is going to Trask. That's the planet from the season two episode, The Heiress, which like I said was directed by Bryce Dallas Howard and introduced us to the live action Bo-Katan. Oh yeah, the episode with the frog lady. Yes, the one with the frog lady and the happiest moment in Star Wars. But the larger point here is that we have to look at the whole picture. This place is terrible. You don't have a single wig. Why would we have wigs? This is a video store. Oh, this isn't Murray's wigs? So how will I cover up my thinning hair. Well, I got a better idea. If you're losing your hair, then you should start using Keeps. They're the sponsor of this video. You guys won't believe how many guys start losing their hair, but they put off doing something about it. Now, there's actually a history of hair loss in my family, so when my hair started to thin, I didn't waste any time. Treatments can take up to four to six months or more to see results, so it is important to act fast, and you have to start early and stick with it. So believe me, if your hair's starting to thin, do not put this off. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. Why, it's even proven to work on Rex's scalp. Keeps stopped my hair loss right in its tracks, and they have more five-star reviews than any of their competitors. And that is why hundreds of thousands of men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention medication. So guys, if you are noticing that you're losing your hair, don't ignore it or hope it goes away. Do something about it, because hair loss stops with Keeps. To get a special offer, go to Keeps.com slash Screen Crush or click our link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Screen Crush. Now back to what I was saying. So they're taking trade routes to Trask, and you might remember the taxation of trade routes being mentioned in the opening crawl to the Phantom Menace. Yeah, what's all that mean anyways? Basically, look, there are hyperspace lanes all throughout the galaxy that work just like highways. So just like we use, say, turnpikes for shipping goods, the hyperspace lanes are used for trade between planets. Whereas like smugglers and criminals have to use smaller unsafe lanes. So it's a big deal for these guys who are smuggling a prince to be on a major trade route. So then they run up on an Imperial Star Destroyer that has been seized by Bo-Katan's Mandalorians. Now this is not the same ship that they stole in the Eris, but we do see that ship parked at the end of the episode. On the ship we see Axe Wolves and Koska Reeves, who we also met in that episode in Season 2. And Koska Reeves is played by Mercedes Renato, aka Snoop Dogg's cousin, aka Mercedes Monet, aka Sasha Banks. Bang! Bank statement, bank statement by Banks. 
And notice that she bears the symbol of the Night Owl on her pauldron. That is the sect of the female Mandalorians that traditionally follow Bo-Katan. In fact, I believe Bo-Katan first formed the Night Owls in opposition to Darth Maul when he took over Mandalore. Could be wrong about that. Let me know in the comics. The captain's name is Shugoth, which is probably a reference to the HP Lovecraft squid monster, the Shoggoth. Kind of on the nose for a squid face lady, but it's a cool homage to the kind of creatures that inspired the monsters that we saw in the original Star Wars trilogy. So the captain references the wars that I mentioned earlier. We finally have peace with the calamari. We have all suffered too much from war. Before dropping this bomb on us. I know it was for love. And then the Mon Cali comes out and gives her a weird fish kiss. And this is actually a callback to season one of The Mandalorian. Remember when Din was offered this gig? That's the best of the lot, a nobleman's son skipped bail. This is probably the same nobleman's son. See, these are the kind of stories that I love, where we just get to see like a very tiny snippet of a larger story. In this case, it's like Romeo and Juliet in space with fish people. Star Wars should always feel like we're only experiencing like a small part of a much larger tapestry. And then we get to Plazir 15. And look, I know some of you are gonna hate this episode, but I thought it was super fun to have a detective adventure right in the middle of all this weird religion and politics stuff. Now, when they first rolled up on the planet, I thought, oh, the Mandalorian built domed cities like the ones they have in their home world. But it turns out these were designed by an Imperial civil engineer to be a perfect model society. So I think that this is an homage to Epcot Center. When Walt Disney, the man, not the company, first conceived of the park, it was going to be a utopian city where people actually lived and worked. We see that Plazier, Jack Black's character, has actually built these Epcot-like domes in a Disney-esque monorail. But people traveling around in tubes seems like a cheeky Jack Black Easter egg. It's me! See, Black is one half of the rock duo to Tenacious D. They're the greatest rock band of all time. And in the song Two Kings, he and KG lay out their plan for a society that's a lot like this planet. No more rich people and poor people. And especially this line. From now on we will travel in tubes. Now there's a lot of political mumbo jumbo when they enter the atmosphere. Welcome to Plasia 15, the Outer Rim's only remaining direct democracy. So here's what all of this means. When the war ended, the Empire surrendered to the New Republic, but the New Republic did not force the Imperial planets to join them. If they wanted to, the planet could vote to join the New Republic and sign the Charter. But if the planet did not want to join the New Republic, then they could stay under Imperial control just with no weapons at all. Following World War I, the Allies struck a similar agreement with the Central Powers, taking away the Central Powers' ability to have a military. Now, of course, during the Great Depression, Hitler found ways to circumvent these regulations, and he slowly built up a very large military force. And I think we're going to see the same thing in Star Wars, where certain planets like this one will agree not to develop weapons while they're secretly creating a military that will lead to the rise of the First Order. J.J. Abrams even said that the First Order was basically built on a what if. What if the Nazis escaped to Argentina and rebuilt the Third Reich? So this world, like most on the Outer Rim, is an independent system. They are not part of the New Republic, which is why they have to hire an outside military force to protect their world. This is also similar to Japan following World War II. The Treaty of San Francisco established that Japan could not have a military, at least not a large military. So instead, the United States military was stationed on the island to protect it from the encroachment of communism. Now, in many ways, this benefited the Japanese economy, freeing up government spending to focus on domestic improvements. And the people of Plazir 15 are seeing similar benefits. Now, notice that there is Mandoa written on Bogotan's console. There's also a lot of arabesque in this episode, and there's a lot of fun Easter eggs buried in that arabesque. We're going to go over all of those toward the end of the video to give Doug time to translate it all. I'm working as fast as I can. Now, is that a, a P or a U? I never can tell. Okay, they're greeted by two former Imperial droids. Notice how they're painted black. I see a bad droid and I want to paint it black. Dude, the Arabesh, come on. Sorry, got a lot to do today, a lot to do. That's all right. So to explain the droids, Bo-Katan says, The Outer Rim. Now, what she means by this is that the Outer Rim is filled with Imperial remnants, warlords, and old weaponry, like we've seen throughout this series. But also, the way she says, The Outer Rim. Is a lot like this iconic line from one of the greatest detective movies ever made. Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. In that movie, the line is meant to say, hey, this is a place where the laws are different, where the corrupt are in control. And there's a parallel here to the lawless outer rim in the galaxy. But also, since this is a detective story, it feels like this homage to Chinatown was deliberate. Bo-Katan and Den offer up their chain codes. What's a chain code? Well, it's basically a data file that spells out your ID and family history. Boba Fett's chain code in season two talked about how his father, Jango Fett, served in the Mandalorian Civil War with Jaster Muriel. Now, this is also an important detail for this episode because it's how Jack Black knows that they have two Mandalorian visitors and thus a loophole into solving their problem. Loophole! 
different, but more on that in just a second. The droid says, As per Article 9 of the Coruscant Accords, permission must be granted from High Senate for access to self-defense forces. Which is also a tidy bit of world building. The Accords were signed in the former capital of the Empire, Coruscant, and they further separate visitors from defense forces. This prevents someone from flying into the world and attacking or sabotaging the military. Then we get to meet the rulers of this world, Jack Black and Lizzo. Now, like I said, these cameos might feel distracting. Yeah, and they pull me too much into the real world. Like, you know, lizards in Star Wars, you know, you know? Sure, I get it. But like, some pretty major movie stars have appeared in Star Wars before. Liam Neeson, Natalie Portman, Forrest Whitaker, Woody Harrelson. I mean, hell, the presence of Bill Burr in Star Wars means that somewhere in space, there's a planet where everybody talks like they're from Boston. I come in in my X-Wing fighter to get into your world, and I, 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 I <laughs> say, my world. I think the bigger issue here is that Jack Black is such a singular personality who always plays characters who are exactly like Jack Black. And Lizzo is charming, but not the most experienced actress. Captain Bombardier is the love of my life, and I know his heart is true. Anyways, I don't mind these cameos because I like the episode. It's a fun Scooby-Doo adventure that explains a lot of Mandalorian politics. I'm in. Yeah, you know, and, and you know what? Liz are super cool. You know, it's Star Wars, you know? Like, like let's, let's not overthink this too much. The only way to enjoy Star Wars is to overthink it. You guys suck. All right, buddy, save it for the comments. And Doug, slow down. If we stop overthinking everything, we'd be out of a job. So at the banquet table, notice that they're all drinking liquid from this tank above, which holds some kind of aquatic creature. This sort of calls to mind the overhead fruit tray in Back to the Future 2, but also it's kind of the reverse of the tank at the beginning of the episode, where food was put into a fish tank, but now it's being taken out. This thing in the tank looks an awful lot like a boar gullet. That's the mind flaying squid that we saw in Solo. So maybe this thing allows people to drink like good, pleasurable memories that it has absorbed, similar to how the droids drink a liquid that lubricates them and eases their sorrow. The name of the city is Plazir, which the Channel Heavy spoilers pointed out means pleasure, and Greg Wilderman on Twitter pointed out that the similarity between this dome city and the one in the movie Logan's Run. Also, notice when they enter the room, the music goes from like ominous to flutes. <laughs> because Lizzo's signature instrument is a flute. And here we also see a Brith, which are native to Dantooine. There's a lot of familiar Star Wars species at the table who also appear throughout the episode as background characters. There are Rodians and Ithorians, Celestans like Sny Snub and Jedi. Um, what they get though? Well, how could they be jamming us if they don't know? The Bith. Play that same song. All right, same song, here we go. Pavanarians like the Frog Lady and the Ishi Tib. Also, notice how the guards are dressed in repurposed and shiny Stormtrooper armor with these awesome Renaissance era capes. They look a lot more like the armor worn by the Jedi in the Clone Wars. Jack Black is playing Plazio, a former Imperial engineer who is a successful graduate of the Amnesty program. Notice how he wears the Arabesh A just like Pershing and Kane do. Yeah, it's kind of messed up they have to keep wearing that, right? Is that like a piece of flair or something? Well, like Brian, for example, has 37 pieces of flair on today. Yeah, like, is there a time limit or do they have to wear this badge for life that says, hey, I used to oppress you? He also says, let's address the bantha in the room. This is, of course, combining the banthas from A New Hope with the phrase, the elephant in the room. Appropriate, since the banthas in A New Hope were actually elephants in costume. Anyways, they've set up a system of elected royalty. We are both royals and elected leaders. A strange system, like how the people in Naboo elected their rulers. I present Queen Amidala, recently elected ruler of the Naboo. Notice that Lizzo has a hologram following her around that shows this bright design of like fairy wings or like a stained glass window. It's ostentatious and pretty and I love it. And I'm also pretty sure that her contract says that she got to hold the baby. Could I perhaps hold the baby? And Grogu is all for it when she offers him nuggies. <laughs> so, I thought the storyline in this episode was very clever, especially how they found a loophole for the Mandalorians to operate. No one in the city is allowed to have weapons, but the New Republic would respect the traditions of a planet's native culture. This would make them exactly the opposite of the Empire, who at every turn would suppress a system's culture. We saw this in Andor on the planet Aldani, when the Imperials were slowly destroying native customs so they could build larger bases. And so, on this world, the Mandalorians are allowed to have weapons. I'm a Mandalorian. Weapons are part of my religion. We find out that the droids in the city are malfunctioning. And remember, Din hates droids. No droids. He especially hates battle droids because they killed his entire family on Concordia. But remember, he has slowly softened his hatred of droids, befriending IG-11 and even trying to rebuild him. I, I guess just so Grogu could do this. No, Grogu. <laughs> Not a pet. Din says, You had me at battle droids which has to be a gag related to this. You had me at hello. 
So the episode is structured a lot like an episode of Scooby-Doo or detective shows like Law & Order. We're introduced to a mystery and then the detectives go around using their various skills to interview people. Along the way, we're introduced to suspects, some of which have very clear motives. Are the Ugnaughts angry because they have to work? Is there a droid uprising coming? But just like in Scooby-Doo, it turns out to be the character that we met first and who we suspected the least. Yes, might have gotten away with it too. It wasn't for these blasted kids and their dogs. Christopher Lloyd is playing the head of security, and what a cameo. Remember, before Back to the Future, he played the heavy in Star Trek III. If we don't help each other, we'll die here. Perfect. Then that's the way it shall be. On the monitors, we see a protocol droid pushing a pram a lot. This is one of the rickshaw droids from Attack of the Clones. And holy hell, I actually just noticed that they actually painted Bo-Katan's freckles on Katie Sackhoff's face. That's awesome. There's also a battle droid carrying boxes. Here's one of the chef droids from Jabba's Palace that we saw in the Book of Boba Fett. And notice how well we tease the big red button here. There's a fail-safe cutoff switch built into the system. The beautiful, shiny button! The jolly, candy-like button! And shout out to Heavy Spoilers for noticing that the clothes on this person's back look like the carpet and the shiny. God, good catch. But Christopher Lloyd makes a bigger point when he says, If we shut down the droids, our citizens would know how to survive. Our society would collapse. That's because your generation is lazy! You got all comfy during the pandemic, nobody knows how to work anymore! So think about the weird utopia that's been created here. People can live however they want, have total freedom, but it's on the backs of droids and the Ugnaughts who repair them. This would create a society that is ripe for rebellion from the lower classes, but later we find out that the droids, I guess, and the Ugnaughts, really enjoy their jobs. However, Christopher Lloyd sees their society as diseased and unfit to survive, but more on that later. The captain says, These droids were all reprogrammed to serve the community from the stockpile of captured Imperial robots scheduled to be scrapped at Carthon. These Carthon chop fields are a New Republic scrapyard where Bill Burr's character was working last season. We also found out this season that the New Republic is way into decommissioning old ships and turning them into scrap. So then they go to the Ugnaughts. Now, Ugnaughts are a species of droid techs that we first saw in The Empire Strikes Back working in Bespin. They were mostly background characters until Din Djarin met Quill in episode one of this show. I have spoken. Quill talked about how he was a slave to the Empire and then he purchased his freedom. Now, I don't think these guys are slaves though because this place is subject to New Republic authority. But like, what if they do have slaves like in the basement they're hiding from the New Republic? At the very least, it reminded me of the Star Trek episode, The Cloud Miners, where the crew comes to a planet where half the people live in the clouds and have these like elegant lifestyles, while the other half work in poisoned mines because the brain damage they suffer from working in the mines means they're only good for working in the mines. Still topical? even today. Bo-Katan can't get their attention, but Din remembers what he learned from his late friend Quill. You will answer our questions and help us with our task. I have spoken. You'll remember this is how Quill always ended his conversations. I have spoken. Then they go to the loading dock where the super battle droids are now called loaders. The B-1 battle droid foreman is voiced by Matthew Wood, who voiced the battle droids all through the Clone Wars. And they are always a delight. Look, Jedi, fire. Oh, wait. <laughs> And he is also the voice of General Grievous, but actually my favorite voice Easter egg in the episode is the Mon Cala Prince, who is voiced by Harry Holland, brother of Tom Holland. Screen Crush's Colton Ogburn had a cool cameo that he noticed in this scene. What was it? Okay, so Din Djarin and Will Smith's character from iRobot already have a lot in common with their badassery and distrust for droids. But this scene from The Mandalorian Episode 6 where Din is messing with the super battle droids, trying to figure out which one is malfunctioning, and he's like poking at them. That reminded me so much of this scene for my robot when Will Smith's character is doing the exact same thing, poking at them, trying to find the one that has been malfunctioning, and of course it works, and both scenes end with like this big chase scene. We see both Will's character and Den thrown across the room by their respective robots. So when I saw that happening in Mandalorian, I was like, hey, I see you. Super cool observation, Tiny TV Man. And then there's a foot chase through the city, which is filled with Arabesh letters. Doug, how we come up with the Arabesh letters? Er, I'm still looking, person. Why is it all so blurry? Back to that later then. I love how Bo-Katan used her boosters to jump over this obstacle. It's my favorite jump in a movie since this. 
There are lots of familiar species and droids throughout the city, including the Imperial RA-7 and Astromech droids here that we also saw when they first arrived on the planet. This Celestin lady is on a bonnet right here, and the speeder here looks like a hybrid of the grill of Luke's X-38 and the body of the M-68 that Han drove at the beginning of Solo. Hey, how come Super Battle droids don't have heads? They actually do have heads, but they're just inside their chests. I think they did this because it was way too easy for the Jedi to cut off the heads of the B-1 battle droids. Oh, cool, thanks. They run by these bikes, which look a lot like the ones the mods drove in the Book of Boba Fett, minus all the mirrors on the side. In the restaurant, they run past this dignitary from the show Andor, This Is Your Mom, and outside there is an Ugnaught enjoying herself. So, you know what? I guess maybe they're not slaves after all, because this one's on the surface and having a good time. Yeah! These people are all like the humans in Wally, though. They're living a life of total luxury while droids do all the work for them. Sounds amazing. Yeah, right? Hey, you know what? Maybe ChatGPT could... Nope, get to work. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so they find the equivalent of like a matchbook that leads them to a droid bar. This is another trope you see in detective stories. In the bar, there are many familiar droids. Skipping over the ones we've pointed out already elsewhere in the video, there's a BLX-5 droid like Bollocks. That's the droid that used to crew the Millennium Falcon with Han Solo in the novel At Star's End, which was the original Star Wars spinoff novel, or at least one of them. And we see the taxi driver droids that we saw on Coruscant that are based on Ralph McQuarrie's original design for C-3PO, which of course are based on Maria the Robot from the movie Metropolis. And then there's a protocol droid and several droids in the model of RX-24, the droid that operated the Star Tours ride at Disney, and that model also appeared in the bar in the Book of Boba Fett. Here on the left is an EV droid and a gonk droid right down here in the middle. These droids are playing Sabacc, the Star Wars card game where Han won the Millennium Falcon from Lando. The cantina reversal is also interesting because the original scene in The New Hope seems to be a reference to racial segregation. But in Star Wars, it's probably because there was a lot of droid resentment after the Clone Wars, or because they didn't want walking digital recorders in a CD bar. I mean, this is getting into like a wider issue of droid rights. I loved how the music stops and they all stare at them like this is the inverse of the most Eisley Cantina where droids were not allowed. But the bartender makes it pretty clear that the droids do enjoy at least having a purpose. We don't want to be replaced. We still have a lot to contribute. And that droid is voiced by Seth Gable who played Lincoln Lee on Fringe. Ah, oh, very cool. It is cool. He makes a point to say that a lot of the droids are getting older, like the Separatist droids from the Clone Wars. Now, these are the droids that Christopher Lloyd was able to reprogram because, as a former Separatist, he was very familiar with their designs. He was also part of the Techno Union who built the droids to begin with. Then he describes the liquid they're all drinking. It is a viscous lubricant that protects against mechanical wear while delivering program refreshing subparticles. So, this is called Nepenthe. Nepenthe is a real plant, but in the Odyssey, Homer described it as a drug that chased away sorrow. So is Jack Black working these droids into a miserable cycle of sorrow where they are cursed to sustain organic life for fear of deactivation? Hey, check it out. The autopsy droid makes the same hover sound that we heard in the first Star Wars. Of course, the autopsy examination is another trope from detective shows. Look at the root system. This level of smushing is consistent with someone stepping on the am after it was dropped. The dead often give the final secret that points to the real culprit. In this case, it's Doc Brown. Great Scott! When the autopsy droid malfunctions, Den finally uses the dark saber, I guess so we can remember that he has it. So the lab tech is played by comedian Jen Kober, and she helps them discover the nano droids hidden inside these other droids. Nano droids are kind of like nanobots, and they have been seen a bit in Star Wars before. Jedi Padawan Barriss Offee used them to stage a bombing of the Jedi Temple. She then framed Ahsoka Tano for that crime leading Ahsoka to walk away from the Jedi Order. She also says, They were originally manufactured by the Techno Union. You remember the Techno Union? These guys. The Techno Union are. Now, the Techno Union were eventually absorbed by the Empire, but during the Clone Wars, they were a consortium of corporations that monopolized manufacturing in the galaxy. Again, this clue points to a former Separatist who would be familiar with all of this tech. So, when the captain's profile comes up, we even see the symbol of the Techno Union in the corner, identifying him as a former member of this guild. Man, and I love this silly little episode. It's like that episode of Clone Wars where the Prime Minister was getting kickbacks for poison tea on Mandalore, and it even turns out that Doc Brown lied about the failsafe button. There's a failsafe cutoff switch built into the system. If I trigger this failsafe, it will convert the planet's docile workforce back into battle droids. Now, the button will turn every droid into a violent battle droid, which the Channel Heavy spoilers pointed out is a lot like Order 66. But the Clone Wars actually ended when Anakin deactivated all the droids at the Separatist headquarters on Mustafar at the end of Revenge of the Sith. So, Doc Brown's button is kind of like an inverse of how the war ended. His own sweet, sweet, sweet revenge. So, it was like the button at the end of Wally all along. Yes, so then he goes on with his Separatist monologue. Separatist is a pejorative term. Count Dooku was a visionary. But wait, Dooku was a Sith Lord. A Sith 
Lord. And weren't the Separatists like all made up of droids? Okay, buddy, let's take a step back here to explain the Clone Wars from a certain point of view. Dooku left the Jedi Order so he could take the title of Count on his home world of Serrano. He was described as a political idealist, not a murderer. So the galaxy did not know that he was like tempted by Darth Sidious and became a Sith Lord. As far as the galaxy was concerned, Dooku was like a well-meaning guy. They all adore him. They think he's a righteous dude. And the Separatist government was funded and controlled by cartels like the Banking Clan and the Trade Federation. But the Confederacy of Independent Systems were also filled with thousands of planets who were tired of the Republic and wanted a less corrupt government. We see the Separatist Senate in the Clone Wars episode, Heroes on Both Sides, and we see that they're all just people who want to be left alone. And here we see that they believed in Dooku and his dream, and they blamed the Jedi for his defeat. So Palpatine was actually able to make both sides hate the Jedi by the end of the war. The Jedi both tried to overthrow the Republic, and they murdered Dooku and killed the CIS. And then Bo-Katan does this. Or politics. Which is gonna make a lot of Star Wars fans cheer because not everybody likes politics in their space adventures. I do, but I'm a weirdo. I'm a Back at the dining hall, which by the way is way more welcoming than the last Imperial banquet that we saw. We would be honored if you would join us. Yeah, do you think they actually sat down to eat after that? Like, like, what do they talk about? I don't know, I guess Vader was probably like, oh, I knew a guy with the droid named R2-D2 or something like that. Anyways, they walk in and find the wealthy elites playing space croquet with Grogu helping Lizzo to cheat. <laughs> And this line, if that isn't the quarter calling the stifling slimy, is something we've heard before in the book of Boba Fett. If that's not the quarter calling the stifling slimy, Lizzo tells him, for now you must live in exile on the moon of Paraquat. So we've seen something like this in Clone Wars. The real Mandalorians, the ones who wear armor, were exiled by the pacifist Mandalorians to the moon Concordia, where Din Djarin is from. And a paraquat is a plant that is used in pesticides. In other words, it's like somebody who turns on their own kind, like a security officer who sides with droids. And you might know paraquat from this. You human paraquat? Lizzo presents them with a key to the city brought by an LEP service droid, AKA rabbit droid, like we've seen in the Clone Wars and here in the Book of Boba Fett. And then when she knights Grogu, the music that plays is the same theme as when he left with Luke to become a Jedi Knight. To belong with, he's one of your kind. And then finally, we get to the Mandalorians. I was so grateful for this scene because I think the show has not been clear about the dark saber and why it entitled people to rule Mandalore. Like, why is Din not the leader of this sect? And here it's explained. Din's Mandalorians believe that you have to keep your helmet on while these Mandalorians believe only in the dark saber. The ruler of Mandalore must possess the dark saber. Now notice that we do see the same Imperial ship that was boosted last season and several Mandalorian fighters like Bo-Katan's gauntlet. So, all right, look, a little bit, a small little bit of history here. Bo-Katan's sister ruled Mandalore, but she was a pacifist. Bo-Katan was part of the warrior sect and they were taken over by Darth Maul. Then Bo-Katan overthrew Darth Maul, but the planet was conquered by the Empire. Years later, Later, Sabine Wren gave the Darksaber to Bo-Katan, and then all the houses and clans swore loyalty to her. The problem is, the Darksaber can only be won in combat. So at some point, Moff Gideon defeated Bo-Katan in combat, giving him the right to rule Mandalore until Din defeated him. Now, it seemed like this season was setting up a conflict between Bo-Katan and Din Djarin, but then she didn't even seem to care about the Darksaber at all. Wave that thing around, and they'll do whatever you say. You get the feeling that Bo-Katan doesn't believe in any of the old traditions, like a nihilist. He believes in nothing. He believes in nothing, La Bosca, nothing. But here she challenges combat for leadership of her group, like Maul challenged Pre Vizsla for leadership during the Clone Wars. Notice though, she does not want to kill him and repeatedly asks him to yield. He finally does, but it does not earn her leadership, until Din explains the Darksaber loophole from Episode 2. Would this blade then not belong to her? So he hands it over and all is well. <laughs> Now, there was one throwaway line in here that I think did a lot of heavy lifting for explaining groups of Mandalorians. A misguided zealot possesses the blade. One, I might add, who has not one drop of Mandalorian blood in his veins. This is telling us why exactly these people are not following Din Djarin, and it's also explaining the divisions that exist in this culture. It's also like super easy to understand. We may not like get the nuances of these people, but we understand racism and religious persecution. But back to the Darksaber rules. Maul won it from Pre Vizsla, but then Ahsoka Tano beat Maul. Maul afterwards though kept the saber, and then he left it on Dathomir where it was picked up by Sabine Wren, and she gave it to Bo-Katan. But here's the thing, the saber 
still by rights belong to Ahsoka Tano. Ahsoka did not lose a duel that we know of until she fought Darth Vader in Rebels, and even then she was rescued by some time travel shenanigans. So really, the saber should have belonged to Ahsoka or to Darth Vader, in which case it would have passed on to Luke Skywalker. So Luke is the actual ruler of Mandalore according to these silly rules. Actually, person, I think you had to win the duel with the dark saber present in the fight. So I guess technically Darth Maul was the last person to hold the dark saber in the right ranks. Nobody ever beat him in a duel when he had the dark saber. Correct the mundo. Bo-Katan is kind of the natural choice for leader though, because she is from a family of pacifists, she was part of Death Watch, led an uprising, opposed the Empire, lived with the children of the Watch, she has walked many paths, and as the Armorer says, You have walked both worlds. You are the one who can unite us. She ignites the saber, but sadly, unlike Angela Bassett, doesn't do the thing. And for all of Mandalore. Hey Doug, we ready on that Arbash translation yet? Yep, here you go. Oh great, thank you. Ooh, there's some good ones in here. You're really going to like these. Control Override, Camera 77097397, and Sector 7G, probably a reference to The Simpsons. One of your organ banks from Sector 7G. Because this workstation does look a lot like Homer's in the power plant. Plazier 15, Premium Droid Rentals, Joanna Cafe, Dance Lounge Open, Open, and Pew, as in Pew Pew. The Orbit Nightclub, COOS, Speed, Hades Dog, Spa Apocalypse, Caution Refreshments, The Resistor. That's the droid bar that's a play on resisting the power and also a circuit that holds back electricity to prevent an overload. So the bar lets the droids relax so they won't rise up against the government. 787-NMFEMTO-2044-1511, scope active zoom level, controls, good thing we translated that for you. 1225-NMZEPTO-2051-1515, code deciphered, search complete, A-F-E-T-Y-O-U-R-M-O-M, -E and this is the best one, best of all, I swear, it shows that the people at Lucasfilm they see us. This one reads, this means nothing. However, fans may interpret the hell out of it. And then right here, CSI FTW, and the flag at the end reads Vizsla, as in Clan Vizsla. Pre Vizsla was Bo Katan's original leader, and his relative Paz Vizsla lives in the covert. So maybe he'll be the key to reuniting these different groups. Hey, I just want to say thanks for the keeps. Now I have hair. I have hair! All right, so you're actually gonna rent a video? No way, I'm gonna use my wig money to subscribe to Netflix. Later, loser, ha <laughs> ha That's just me. Yeah, it really was. And just a reminder to stop your hair loss today, click our link in the description for a special offer from Keeps. But I wanna know what all of you thought about this episode. Let me know down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.